This is the final part of the three-part series on interpreting the UA. The focus will be microscopy, and at the end I'll tie it back together with parts 1 and 2 when discussing some common patterns of UA abnormalities in different types of renal disease. The learning objectives, to be able to list causes of red blood cells, white blood cells, crystals, and casts in the urine, and to be able to identify common patterns of UA abnormalities. I'll start off similarly to the last video with talking about how to prepare the urine for microscopy. First, at least 10 milliliters is centrifuged for 5 minutes at a speed which varies depending upon the characteristics of the centrifuge. Most of the supernatant, that is the liquid layer that settles on top, is poured off and the remaining pellet, which is the solid substance at the bottom, is resuspended by gently shaking the tube. A small sample is then applied to a microscope slide with cover slip. The resuspended material is referred to as the urine sediment, which is then looked at under a microscope. There are some stains that are occasionally used to aid in the identification of certain structures, but examination of unstained urine is usually sufficient. When examining urine under microscopy, remember to consider the storage age and conditions. For example, most microscopic components, such as cells, crystals, and casts, might start to break down if the sample is too old. And also be aware that after refrigeration, which might seem like a good idea in most circumstances, crystals can actually precipitate which otherwise wouldn't be present, thus leading to a false positive. So let's now talk about possible findings. Red blood cells are quantified as the number of cells per high-powered field, which is usually 400x. Unexpectedly, RBCs in the urine don't look red at all during microscopy, but can be identified by their lack of nuclei. Individual physicians may have different cutoffs for this, but most commonly, three or more RBCs per high-powered field is considered to be abnormal. And in particular, the presence of dysmorphic RBCs is strongly suggestive of glomerular disease. There are many, many causes of RBCs in the urine. In very approximate order of decreasing frequency, RBCs can be caused by UTIs, renal stones, GU malignancies, recent instrumentation, including Foley placement, coagulopathy, glomerular nephritis, sickle cell anemia, renal tuberculosis, vigorous exercise, and contamination with menstrual blood. While some etiologies of urine RBCs, also called hematuria, will be obvious from the history, some will not be, including malignancy, which is why anyone with an elevation of urine RBCs should have it rechecked and, if persistent, should usually undergo a urologic workup. White blood cells are also quantified as the number of cells per high-powered field. Greater than 5 is generally considered to be abnormal. There are many, many causes of WBCs in the urine. If you remember from the last video on urine dipsticks, there is a long list of causes of a positive leukocyte esterase. Since leukocyte esterase comes from leukocytes, or white blood cells, it doesn't take a genius to predict that these lists are highly overlapping. Bacteria are a common finding on urine microscopy and are consistent with a UTI. Here in the picture, you can see the rod-shaped bacteria as the tiny elongated shapes next to the white blood cells. However, in the absence of symptoms, particularly if leukocyte esterase and nitrites are negative, the presence of bacteria is probably due to poor collection technique. At this point, I'm going to summarize how to use the UA to diagnose a UTI. Although UAs are frequently used to assist this diagnosis, there are no standardized approaches on how to do this. The presence of nitrites is the most specific finding and has the highest positive predictive value. However, leukocyte esterase, WBCs, and even bacteria on microscopic exam are not specific and their presence does not necessarily indicate infection. Also consider that all of these, including nitrites, may be present in the setting of an indwelling urinary catheter, even in the absence of a pathologic infection. This is sometimes referred to as colonization of the catheter where bacteria may be growing on the catheter itself, but not actually causing any problems to the patient. The diagnosis of UTI needs to also consider the presence of symptoms and a positive urine culture, if one is done, 
which is probably not necessary in young, otherwise healthy women with typical symptoms. Since catheters can even lead to false positives with urine culture, diagnosing a UTI in this setting is particularly challenging. To improve diagnostic accuracy of the UA, it's often recommended that the urine sample be taken shortly after the catheter has been exchanged, if possible, although I am unaware of the existence of literature that supports that practice. Now, RBCs, WBCs, and bacteria in the urine are pretty straightforward. And even if the presence of a UTI is uncertain, most experienced clinicians aren't scratching their heads trying to determine the possible significance of those abnormal findings. That's in contrast to the last two parts of the UA that I'll be talking about, crystals and casts. Crystals are highly organized microscopic solids, usually composed of a very small number of different ions and or molecules. The science of crystal formation in the urine is quite complicated and fascinating, but in extreme brief, whether or not a certain crystal forms is most dependent upon the concentrations of the ions and molecules that make up the crystal, as well as the urine pH. Crystals in the urine are actually very common, and for most crystals, as long as they are small in number, they are not necessarily pathologic. This is particularly true in urine samples that have been sitting at room temperature for a while, since lower temperatures favor crystal precipitation. Unfortunately, there is no specific cutoff as to what constitutes a pathologically high quantity of crystals. I'm going to run through the six most commonly discussed crystals. First, uric acid crystals. These form in acidic urine and have a slightly pleomorphic appearance under the microscope, which means that they can have a variety of shapes, though they are most often slightly elongated with rounded edges that can mimic the shape of an American football. While uric acid crystals are probably best known as the cause of gout when they form in joints, when they form in the urine, they are most associated with tumor lysis syndrome, in which there is a massive sudden death of cancer cells in the body due to the first round of chemotherapy, and all of that DNA is rapidly broken down, with uric acid being the end product. Next are calcium phosphate crystals, which form in alkaline urine. These tend to be very elongated, may have one or two pointed ends, and frequently form in rosette-type structures. Although in huge quantities, calcium phosphate can lead to the formation of renal stones, microscopic calcium phosphate crystals on microscopy are not suggestive of any specific systemic disease. Magnesium ammonium phosphate crystals, which are also called struvite or triple phosphate crystals, are seen in alkaline urine, particularly when the ammonium concentration is unusually high. They have a sharp rectangular appearance. They can be seen in UTIs by urease producing organisms such as Proteus and Klebsiella, which lead to high ammonia levels as well as alkaline pH. Calcium oxalate crystals come in two varieties, both of which are not pH dependent. Calcium oxalate dihydrate tends to form highly regular squares or rhomboids which actually have a tetrahedron or octahedron shape when viewed in three dimensions. As with some other stones, their presence may increase the risk a patient gets a kidney stone, but they otherwise have no significant specific disease association. Calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals are pleomorphic and can form as rods, ovoids, and most distinctively, a dumbbell shape. Although most patients with calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals are normal, they are also associated with ethylene glycol ingestion. This toxin should be strongly considered when a patient presents with an unexplained elevated anion gap acidosis, renal failure, and the presence of these crystals on urine microscopy. Last, cysteine crystals, which form in acid urine, look like flat hexagonal plates and are diagnostic of cystinuria, a genetic defect in renal cysteine transport. Finally, the last significant finding on a UA is the presence of casts. Casts are long cylindrical structures formed in the renal tubules due mostly to precipitation of TAM horsefall protein. TAM horsefall protein is the most abundant protein normally excreted in urine, though the normal function of it is not well understood. Cast formation is promoted by acidic and or concentrated urine. Casts are described based on the elements that are embedded within the mucoprotein matrix as the casts form.
These can then provide important insight into the etiologies of acute kidney injury. There are a ton of different types of casts which are divided into acellular and cellular categories. Overall, the most common casts are hyaline casts. These consist of precipitated protein without other constituents. They are nonspecific but can be seen in dehydration in which the urine is of low flow and abnormally concentrated. So-called money brown casts are strongly suggestive of acute tubular necrosis. Waxy casts are nonspecific and are seen in a variety of acute and chronic renal diseases. Fatty casts contain yellow tan fat globules and are strongly suggestive of nephrotic syndrome in which fats and protein freely filter through the defective glomeruli. Pigment casts contain one of several colored compounds such as heme or bilirubin. And granular casts are believed to be from degeneration of cellular casts. Those cellular casts have two main varieties. Red blood cell casts, which are strongly suggestive of glomerular nephritis, and white blood cell casts, which are strongly suggestive of interstitial inflammation, which can be either infectious or non-infectious. All right, so I need to tell you, if you're still with me at this point, I'm impressed with your dedication to learning about the urinalysis. We're almost at the end. I'm going to finish by putting together a little bit from all three videos in this series by reviewing five classic patterns of UA abnormalities, specifically looking at gross appearance, specific gravity, protein, leukocyte esterase, nitrites, RBCs, WBCs, and casts. Keep in mind that these diseases don't always present with the exact patterns I'll be listing, but these are the most typical associations. First, UTIs. The urine of a patient with a UTI is frequently cloudy or turbid. It can have any specific gravity. Protein may or may not be present. Leukocyte esterase is almost always positive, and nitrites uh, may or may not be positive, partly depending upon which specific species of bacteria is causing the infection. RBCs may be present, and WBCs are almost always present, while casts are usually not seen. Next, dehydration, or more generally, decreased renal perfusion. The urine will be concentrated, so it will appear dark yellow and have a relatively high specific gravity. Protein may be positive on dipstick on account of the low urine output and secondary increased concentration. Leukocyte esterase, nitrites, RBCs, and WBCs are all negative, and hyaline casts are common. With acute tubular necrosis, the color may be dark yellow or amber. The specific gravity is relatively low since the dysfunctional tubules lack their normal concentrating ability. Protein leukocyte esterase, RBCs, and WBCs all may or may not be present, and ATN is classically associated with so-called muddy brown casts. Then there are two categories of glomerular disease. In the nephrotic syndrome, the urine can look foamy on account of proteins decreasing the urine surface tension. The presence of severe proteinuria also leads to a very high specific gravity. Leukocyte esterase, nitrites, RBCs, and WBCs are all absent, and the urine may contain fatty casts. Finally, in nephritic syndrome, the urine can look red or brown, and specific gravity is relatively high. Protein may be mildly or moderately elevated. Leukocyte esterase may or may not be present. RBCs are almost always present, and dysmorphic morphology is strongly suggestive of this specific diagnosis, as opposed to other etiologies of hematuria. WBCs may or may not be present, and the patient may have RBC casts on microscopy. So that concludes this discussion of the interpretation of a urinalysis. I hope you found this short video series interesting and useful, and please don't forget to like and share the videos.